school I can talk on whatever I like, and so uh, I'm talking on balancing games. So uh, I'm going to divide this talk into two parts. One is going to be talking about people frequently refer to game balance. They call games being out of balance. They, uh, uh, but the, the terms are usual, usually used without much precision. So I'm going to try to define what, what is meant by balance in general. And then I'm going to talk about some techniques uh, for balance measures. So, what is balance? So, uh, uh, before I start, I want to. Oh, this tells me what's coming next. Okay, uh, so I just recently published a uh, textbook with two co authors on the characteristics of games, and uh, a lot of the concepts that I'm going to use uh, come from this. Uh, our attitude is that uh, the reason we wrote the textbook is because we find that more and more people are entering uh, games professionally, but in colleges, uh, when you come in and start working on movies, say, you've already had 12 years of experience with uh, narrative, and, but when you come into college uh, and want to do games, you've got very little formal experience. And so we're trying to, with this book, to just uh, build up a basic, uh, a basic vocabulary, and, uh, and, and, and so that's where we're coming from. Uh, in characters of games, we, we, we deal with all games, but uh, games is such a broad subject that, that frequently uh, when we talk about games, uh, you'll think of some game which doesn't work for well. And because of that, uh, we, or we, uh, we, we define ortho games. Ortho games are games which are uh, uh, finite and end in the player's in rank. So this is like chess or bridge or most traditional games, but it doesn't include uh, uh, a lot of games, also games which are unbounded in length or where the object isn't to get points or something like that. Oftentimes when we're talking about we'll apply to those games, we might have to be creative in order to apply them. Uh, so uh, in general, if I say something that, uh, that doesn't apply to the game you're thinking about, uh, there's a good chance that that's because you're thinking about a game that isn't going to work out game. So, uh, when we talk about balance, oftentimes what we're talking about is strategic collapse. Uh, and strategic collapse is, is when, when players have a tactic or a strategy which they want to use, which they think should be usable, which isn't usable, they will call the game unbalanced. Uh, and this is particularly bad when, when there's one strategy that works and the others just don't work at all. So there's uh, two types of unbalance here. One is where there's something which they want to do, which they don't feel like can do. They might consider it unbalanced in a minor way. And then uh, it's unbalanced in a major way if there's just one thing to do. So uh, oftentimes I like to construct toy games, what I call toy games to illustrate. These are games you don't want to play because they're usually pretty bad, but they uh, demonstrate purpose, or demonstrate uh, what I'm trying to talk about. And so in this case, uh, uh, this is Big Rock. Um, and big Rock works just like rock, paper, scissors, except uh, Big Rock uh, Big Rock beats rock. So Big Rock beat, uh, loses the paper, it beats scissors, and it beats rock. Okay, the reason why this game would be considered unbalanced is if you want to use rock, or, uh, you ask yourself, why, why is the rock anyway? Uh, it just shouldn't be in the game. And then if you tweak the game a little bit, make it so Big Rock beats everything, well, then it's unbalanced in uh, the second manner where, where there's just only one strategy to use, which is Big Rock. So, if you've got complete strategic collapse, that's a bad thing. But you can argue that certainly not every strategy should be useful, because if every strategy is useful, well, uh, then, then, then uh, there's not really a game. So uh, you don't need to make all your strategies useful, but you do need the, uh, the ones that players or the designer or, or you as the designer think should be useful, those obviously have to be useful. So uh, an illustration using magic. Um, in magic uh, championships, uh, I consider the environment to be healthy when there's uh, about four to eight general deck types at the top. Okay, if, if there's less than four, it feels a little too like rock, paper, scissors, and it's probably felt, it feels 
players feel like the environment is too constrained. And it's really bad if there's only one deck type, because uh, then, then people aren't really playing uh, magic. There's just, there's just one deck to play. Um, and if there's too many deck types, then the field is just too confusing. I'm not sure that's necessarily a bad thing, but the standard philosophy at uh, Wizards of the Coast is that, is that you want to have uh, between four and eight, and that if you get too many, it's a bad thing. And so sometimes strategic collapse, uh, what I refer to as a strategic collapse, has nothing to do with strategy. Um, so uh, if, if something dominates play to a point where people lose interest in other things, that can be uh, a, a, an unbalancing thing too. So for example, going first in a game, if you win 90% of the time, you, uh, the players might lose interest in the rest of the game. Um, Similarly, if you had a, a game where, where there was an I win card, that would be considered unbalanced. Um, so uh, additionally, there's, uh, if, if the play style you as a player are after or you want to encourage as a designer is not available, then, then that might be considered unbalanced in that way because people play games in a lot of different ways. For instance, players might uh, be interested in collecting. Collecting is not a part of every game, but if it looks like there should be collecting and you've got a player who wants to collect and it doesn't really uh, uh, work in your game, uh, then they might consider it unbalanced in that regard. So uh, we've got people who like to build, collect, fight, explore, socialize. There's all sorts of things people like to do in the game. And if they sit down to the game and for some reason they feel like they ought to be able to do that, they'll consider it unbalanced if it's not available for them. So uh, an example using a game which, uh, which uh, I won't say the name of um, uh, that, that personally affected me uh, was uh, there was a, 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 an MMRPG which broke down exploration, fighting, and trading into different tracks. So, so it appealed to all, it, it uh, had mechanisms to appeal to all these different things, all these different uh, uh, archetypes of play. But what I wanted to do was to find a real challenge. I had a little ship, and I wanted a great big challenge. And uh, I worked and worked and worked to, to defeat, to, to master my challenge. And uh, when I finally, finally succeeded, uh, I realized that, that I got an, a, a reward, which is about 15% more than I would have if I had done you know, a string of one minute challenges. And, and so it was, I, I considered unbalanced in that regard, so for me, I wanted uh, uh, a big challenge, and so I would have considered that unbalanced for somebody seeking a big challenge. Now, at the high level of the game, there was probably some real challenges there. These MMRPGs are that way. Uh, low levels of World of Warcraft are often very easy, but you can find big challenges. And uh, I'm going to skip my bingo example. Uh, I like to divide balance into two types. Uh, there's componential balance, uh, where you're trying to balance the components of a game. So that would be something like magic. And then there's holistic balance. That's where you're trying to uh, balance the entire gestalt of the game. So examples of this would be componential, would be in hearts, magic, or Diablo. Should the queen be worth 13 points in hearts should uh, this uh, fire, uh, a lightning bolt cost one red mana, and uh, in Diablo should that sword give you 152 intelligence? Those are uh, questions about componential balance. So when you're talking about balance for the whole game, then you're asking different questions. Should you play hearts to 100, 100 points? Should you pass cards? Um, in magic, do you begin with 20 life? Or, uh, do you start, should you start with seven cards? And uh, in Diablo, should you be able to sell your equipment for money? Uh, the division is often muddy. Um, it's some uh, componentially, componential balance is actually a part of the holistic balance, but it's uh, often useful to divide it up. So one problem uh, that designers often run into for, with balance is that if, uh, is, is what audience you balance for. Uh, the problem is that there are a lot of different audiences out there and if you balance for just one, you might leave the others unsatisfied. 
the most common uh, way this is, uh, this is seen is where you see games which are balanced just for experts because the designer and their friends tend to be experts, but then it's not balanced for beginners. And so where you've got something is where the uh, expert is happy, but the beginner, the noob, the child, the casual player, the non-competitive player, the intermediate player, maybe they're all unhappy. They're not having a good game. Uh, and what happens is they'll leave the game, and then everybody's unhappy because uh, there's not enough people to play. And uh, one problem with this sort of design is that you don't even know if you're designing for the top level expert. There might be levels above. Uh, and so then the uber expert comes, and the game may not even be designed for them or might, might not even be balanced for them. And so uh, uh, this is a real challenge to, to make a game which is satisfying for a, a lot of different audiences. So uh, that means you have to be prepared to patch your game. Uh, and uh, many, many games have been patched. Uh, here's a few. Um, different, uh, and that's when the game is first played as players evolve their, uh, their play. Uh, you may have to do things to balance it to make it uh, to make it uh, maintain its fun nature. Um, the fact that uh, your skill tends to go up logarithmically over time uh, helps you because uh, with a little bit of experience, you 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 get much better. And so, if you can get people over that initial hoop, uh, initial. Uh, uh, hump, then you can get to an area where people might be able to compete with each other uh, and, and, and have a good time. Um, and so you design, perhaps in general, you should design uh, somewhere up that, uh, that, that, that uh, uh, curve. Uh, you can't design to the top because games tend to be complicated enough that, that it's impossible to design to the top and you don't have an audience there anyway. And uh, hopefully, you can either patch the game if uh, your audience moves beyond that, or uh, it will be close enough. So uh, an example of this with me was with this uh, game Spectromancer, which I designed with a uh, Russian designer, uh, Alexei Stankovich. Um, and w this game launched with uh, six different character classes. And there was uh, one character class that was given for free, uh, the cleric, and the others you had to pay for. And the intent was that the character class that was given for free was balanced with the others. That is, you got a fair game. We did not want to give you the gimped class. Um, but, of course, it was perceived as being uh, the weakest because it was free. And so we asked ourselves, uh, we, we did a, a study on it to see whether it was, uh, it was too weak or too powerful. And what we found was, was pretty interesting, which was that uh, among beginners, the clerics won 46%, so it was a little weak. Uh, as you became intermediate, you lost even more. But then the experts actually preferred the cleric. And the reason was because the cleric was a well-balanced class that was showing up all the mechanics in the game. And uh, the expert could take advantage of that balance, whereas the beginners couldn't. Similarly, the necromancer was regarded as a very powerful class, and when we did a study of that, we found that it was uh, a little better than average for the beginner, uh, quite a bit better for the intermediate, but then uh, the experts, it became not so good. It became a, 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 an inferior class, and the reason for that is because the necromancer had some very powerful uh, tech, uh, tactics which were available to it, but somebody who knew what they were doing could uh, overcome that. And so the experts knew how to overcome that, and then the, uh, the, the, cleric, the necromancer was not so good after that. And so uh, we did the study for all of them, and we found that, that, that each class was favored for a different group of players. Uh, the, uh, nec the mechanician was good for the beginner, but not so good for the experts. The cleric was good for the experts. And uh, we decided, of course, the important thing there is that every class had an audience. It didn't necessarily have to be uh, um, a, a, a favored class for all audiences. So uh, similarly, in Magic, um, the beginner might really like a particular card. Uh, and they're not wrong to like that card just because the card is, in some sense, not powerful enough. It works just fine among their peers. But, and when they try to play with the expert's card, uh, they may not do as well. When the beginner plays against the expert, 
they might have to adjust their strategy, but beginners tend to play more with beginners, so that's not necessarily an issue. So there's room in a game like Magic for cards which are designed for beginners and designed for experts. And uh, games which aren't ortho games don't end up with a winner and a loser. Balance is still an issue. Um, when I was working on third edition uh, Dungeons and Dragons, we had uh, an example, we had lots of examples of unbalances. Uh, there was a scimitar which did one die five damage and there was a sword which did one die six. And the way the designers up to this point had thought about it was that the role player didn't care because they were playing a role. They would use the scimitar because it was cool. Um, and uh, we argued that, that that was actually making the role player suffer because why should they be less effective because they want to role play? It's a role playing game. And, um, and uh, to me, it's a lot like somebody saying that, uh, that uh, the people going across the bridge aren't engineers, so they don't need the bridge to be structurally sound. And then you end up with situations like this. That's a pretty cool picture. Um, so, uh, balance is an art, not a science. And uh, I was often uh, asked if my bath math background helped in my game design. And uh, I've answered often that, that it does help, but the actual math I use is typically not much more than somebody who, say, plays poker seriously, picks up playing serious poker. Uh, game design incorporates lots of different areas, and I haven't found any that are uh, not a, a, I have not found any areas that are not of use. This is uh, similar to writing. Uh, a writer won't say that knowledge of art doesn't help. Uh, everything helps. Everything helps with writing. Everything helps with uh, designing games. Um, oftentimes, then, I find that, that people are really asking for whether there's a formula to balance your games and whether I use that, because uh, a lot of my games are very complicated and they expect there to be some mathematical formula. Um, well, when I was working on uh, Netrunner, I tried to put that to practice. People had asked about that for Magic, and so I tried to make a formula to balance ma uh, Netrunner. And so I began making a, f uh, a spreadsheet with a formula to figure out how to cost these things. And uh, as I added cards, uh, I would adjust them to, uh, to, to balance them, uh, and, and I would find my formula would spit out a number, and then I would have to fix the formula. Uh, so, for instance, I would add a line here saying if the card is searching for, uh, if the card you're looking for is limited to a program, well, then we have to subtract two. And that would fix the problem with my formula giving out the wrong number for uh, short circuit. Okay, and pretty soon I noticed something uh, disturbing, which was that uh, every single card I added was adding another line to my formula. And then I realized that the formula I was coming up with was never going to predict what the good cost was. It was just going to, uh, it, it, was, it was going to instead just tell me what I chose to cost it. Um, and I decided there was no formula, and uh, that shouldn't come to any surprise because of two things uh, which have already been mentioned. One is that games are very complicated. Uh, we haven't solved Othello yet. I just uh, looked that up. And uh, we just recently solved checkers. Uh, so balancing for the top level uh, is, is certainly, if, you can't, if, you, if we haven't even solved those games, uh, coming up with some definitive balance for a game is, is, uh, is kind of impossible. Uh, the second thing is that uh, this, this point which I already mentioned, which was that uh, games have a lot of different audiences. And uh, you don't want to balance for one at the cost of another unless you're willing to lose that audience. And uh, this correct balance is, is really difficult to find because this is, uh, uh, this is even a moving target because your beginners become intermediate, become experts, your younger players become older players, your casual become serious, your serious go back to becoming casual. Um, and, uh, and so uh, balance becomes more of an issue of uh, psychology than it, uh, mathematics. Um, and you can't expect accurate, uh, definitive formulas for a soft science. Uh, 
so while there is no formula, uh, there's, often, uh, there's often many answers that are equally good, and, uh, and it's a matter of uh, uh, one, again, might call it an art for figuring out that number. For example, in Dominion, would the game be worse if, if uh, your provinces are five? And I have played it with five. Personally, I don't think so. Maybe for some players it would be. Um, and in uh, Ticket to Ride, should there be uh, a few less wild cards or a few more? Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be maybe equally good uh, for a few more or a few less. Um, now, there are catastrophic areas. If you made your provinces cost three in Dominion, uh, that would be pretty bad. And if you made them cost 12, that would probably also be an inferior game. Uh, and, uh, but away from those catastrophic points, uh, balance is really an art. So now uh, I'm going to go through a few specific techniques that, uh, that I've used in balancing, uh, balancing games. The most important is uh, iterative design. Uh, this is uh, particularly important for uh, computer games. Uh, but uh, it's really hard to figure out how your game is going to play without playing it a lot. Uh, and, and even a game as simple as tic-tac-toe, if you haven't played it, it's really hard to understand what, it, what it's going to be about. Um, Magic was play-tested for two years before it was published. Um, games, uh, companies that have a reputation for uh, uh, quality products often play-test their games quite a lot. Paper games are generally a lot easier to prototype than electronic games, uh, but if you're clever about your design, you can often, uh, uh, you, can, you can build in a, a flexibility in your uh, electronic game, which allows you to uh, uh, prototype, tweak your game uh, and iterate it very fast. Um, one benefit of uh, iterative design is that you can't design for experts until you have experts, and the only way to really get experts is to play the game. So uh, as you get, as you iterate, you uh, get more and more expert players, and so then your balance will uh, automatically uh, be able to adjust, a br adjust a br for a broader and broader audience. One of the risks, which uh, a lot of designers run into, is that they keep uh, they lose track of the beginners as they go along, and so you end up with a game which is focused just on the expert. That's a danger of iterative design. So uh, the obvious solution there is to add players as you go. Uh, your, as your beginners become intermediate, add some more beginners, uh, and as your uh, intermediates become experts, you add beginners again, and uh, as long as you're, if you uh, can, can keep all these people happy, well, you're doing pretty well. Um, these days, it's uh, as likely as not to see your games iterated after they've been published. Uh, and there's nothing uh, really wrong with that uh, as long as uh, the amount that it's balanced enough at the beginning to uh, accommodate the levels of play that people start with. Um, what you want to do is make sure, though, that uh, as, as those games are balanced, that, that you don't... Uh, iterate away from the beginner, because then they won't feel welcome to the game. Uh, so another technique that's uh, commonly used is uh, rock, paper, scissors. Uh, rock, paper, scissors is a, is a really excellent structure to keep in mind when balancing a game. Uh, it appears throughout games in one form or another. Uh, on the component level, if you remember I refer to uh, balancing often as com componential or holistic, uh, you'll see uh, rock, paper, scissors. For instance, in Stratego, you've got the spy beating the marshal, uh, beating the general. Uh, on uh, TF2, uh, one of my favorite games, uh, you might see the spy beating the engineer, and the engineer beating the pyro, and the pyro uh, beating the spy. Uh, many war games, you'll see uh, a rock, paper, scissors structure. Uh, and then on the holistic level, you also see it. For example, in uh, StarCraft, if you use the tactic of rushing, you will beat somebody who goes economic, and if you use the economic strategy, you'll beat somebody who's uh, bu uh, uh, hunkered down for, uh, a def uh, in defense, and if you uh, hunker down in defense, you'll beat somebody who's rushing. Um, 
and we can skip some of the, well, this, this example is kind of cool. Uh, in hearts, uh, uh, if you're shooting the moon, uh, you'll beat the people who are constantly ducking the tricks. And uh, if you stand up and stop the moon shooter, uh, then you'll beat the moon shooter. And so in your environment, one of the reasons why this uh, uh, ends up making sort of a, a balanced game is because uh, if your environment is such that everybody's ducking, well, then the opportunity opens up to shoot the moon. And if uh, there's a lot of moon shooting, well, that opens up the opportunity for uh, being the sheriff and stopping the moon shots. Um, note that uh, oftentimes rock, paper, scissors is referred to disparagingly by uh, players or designers uh, uh, because they think rock beats scissors 100% of the time. That's not necessary. Uh, all you have to do is beat it more than 50% of the time and you've got the structure you want. Uh, for example, sometimes in my uh, TF2 example, the spy will beat the pyro. Uh, and. Uh, uh, but as long as, uh, as long as they beat them less than half the time, you have the structure you want. Also note that there can be more than three options. Uh, you can have four, as in this uh, earth, air, fire, and water example. And oftentimes you'll get lots and lots of strategies and components with a crazy set of relationships. And inside, you'll see sometimes there's little rock, paper, scissors uh, structures, either uh, str uh, of strategies or components. Um, and that is fine. Uh, you just want to make sure that any strategy you don't want to see dominated isn't, doesn't have all the arrows pointing in, because this strategy is not available. And you certainly don't want to have the situation where uh, there's an option which points its arrows at everybody else because that's the catastrophic imbalance which uh, I referred to at the beginning. So another technique for balance is, uh, is uh, component costs. Uh, lots of games have different costs to the components. Uh, the component cost can be uh, multiple resources or a single resource. Uh, in Magic, you've got five different colors of mana. Uh, in uh, Settles of Catan, you've got a number of different resources. Um, but uh, uh, during the, and, and there's, <coughs> additionally, these costs can be paid between sessions or during the session. In, in, within a session, you begin out with uh, out any out, out any resources or with the same amount of resources as, as your opponent, and you uh, build up over the game. You can also end up uh, acquiring new components between games, uh, and some this happens in both ways. Uh, in Magic, for example, uh, during the during a particular game, uh, this card will cost uh, four and two white mana, and in between sessions, you might have to pay cash for it. Sometimes a cost is, is gray. Uh, for example, you could regard this as uh, the wild card is costing two in Ticket to Ride because it costs you two draws to pick it up. Uh, and costs can also be subtle. Uh, note, uh, in particular, the 10 on uh, uh, the Z. Uh, score is often where I would put it. I'm still working with the, uh, the uh, definitions here, but uh, um, the important thing for this section is, is there an index which is easily tweaked? Uh, if everybody who was dealt the Z in Scrabble won, you would lower that number. If there's a number that can be tweaked, I regard that as a cost. Mm, and I'm going to skip that. Oh, I will go back to this. Uh, you don't need a cost. You can balance in all sorts of different ways. A magic card, for example, has lots of different things that can be tweaked in order to balance it. Uh, but cost is a way for your developers to get their heads around. Uh, to, they can become experts in one index that really helps them balance the game as a whole. Uh, and uh, this is a game I'm working on currently, and it doesn't have a cost to the cards, uh, and so I'm kind of I'm kind of uh, on on edge about that. I'm hoping that'll work. So uh, here's another technique, uh, which I call benchmarks and non-denomination because I like really boring names. Um, so 
a technique which, is, which I, I've used a number of times is to uh, set a benchmark for the very simple cards uh, or components. So in this case, uh, these cards, if you're not familiar with magic, uh, and, and uh, they're hard to read, but it looks like there's a lot of writing there, but really the first one is a one, the second one's a two, the third one's a three. Um, and, uh, and the benchmark you can play with, uh, um, at the beginning when I was first designing magic, uh, these guys were cheaper because the simplest place to begin out with the balance for your cards is one cost one, two cost two, three cost three. After I played it a bit, I realized that I needed to change that uh, a bit. And then after that, once you've got the vanilla card set, you can begin uh, 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 putting in your new cards just so they don't dominate the old ones. So for example, uh, if I was gonna put flying in, I might cost that at two because if it has a power of one and uh, if, it, if I cost it at one, then the guy who cost one without flying would be dominated by him. And similarly, if something was extra tough, I might cost that at two. And then if something was flying and extra tough, I'd have to price that at three because I don't want it to dominate any of the other guys. Now, this, uh, this makes it so that uh, uh, if you have domination, it becomes really easy to, bal to, to choose what the better strategy or what the better card is. Uh, but if, if, there are constru if, you're, if you've done your balance with this non-domination technique, then people will have different opinions about uh, what's better. And in fact, uh, those opinions, as I mentioned before, are perfectly, uh, you may not be wrong and right. The beginner here might be correct to value the top card because in their audience, it's working just fine. So another technique, hosers. Uh, if a component or a strategy is too powerful, you can construct a, uh, you can add a rule or a component that hoses it. Um, in Magic, I use this a lot. Uh, this card affects flying, so uh, if you use a lot of flying, I might add this card to my deck. If you use a lot of black magic, I might put this in my deck. If you use uh, a lot of cards by a particular artist, I might put this in my deck. <laughs> if uh, you don't have lots and lots of money, I might put this in your deck. <laughs> so. Uh, in StarCraft, uh, <coughs> uh, the observer hoses invisibility, and uh, the raider, the robber in uh, Settlers of Catan hoses uh, resource hoarders. Oftentimes, hosing can create, a, it can be very similar to rock, paper, scissors, and you can see why this would be the case. If you have strategy A, which beats strategy B, and then you add a hoser uh, for strategy uh, A, uh, then you'll, you might get the situation here where A beats B, uh, B beats B with an A hoser, and A with a B with an A hoser beats A. So bidding is a, another way to balance your game. There are uh, many games which uh, feature bidding. And it can look, at, look like a lot of different things. It can look, for example, like, uh, like regular auctions. Uh, but it can also be more subtle. For instance, it can be like a draft in Seven Wonders. Uh, taking turns picking cards from a pile is, uh, is, is a form of bidding. And uh, a magic draft simile is a, is a, a form of bidding. Uh, one advantage to bidding is that it adjusts itself to the levels of your player. If uh, your group values a particular card or strategy a lot, then the bidding will add to the, the game will automatically adjust. Um, and later on when you decide it isn't so good, it'll adjust again. But one of the disadvantages is that uh, it takes a lot of skill to be able to bid, uh, to be able to bid effectively. Uh, the first time you play a game, for example, that relies on bidding, you're likely to be at C. Um, I was <coughs> talking to uh, Donald X about his game uh, uh, Gauntlet of Fools, which you may or may not have seen, but he talked about uh, this as, <coughs> pardon me, um, this is being one of the problems that he ran into with that game. 
the, the bidding in that game was uh, very subtle, and you would uh, bid for a particular warrior, and then you would go into uh, uh, the dungeon and see who got the most money. But people didn't know how to do the bidding, so the first time they would play, they would just not bid at all. They would just take whatever was in front of them, and afterwards, somebody would win, and they'd, they'd say, well, that was kind of random. Um, and if they pursued this game a little more, they would learn that it was actually quite an interesting game, but they need more skill in order to be able to... Uh, in order to be able to ex uh, experience it. We've run to the last section, uh, variants. Um, variants can be used to help balance a game. Uh, the more variants you have in a game, uh, uh, oftentimes the more balanced it'll be perceived in being. Um, and this is often uh, present in card games. Uh, to to see how, how var variants can help you balance a game, consider a game like hearts. Uh, with a random hand, if you received uh, hands which were in a particular variance level each time, you may never uh, be in a position where you want to shoot the moon. But with the variance of the game, sometimes you're dealt hands which are appropriate for shooting the moon. And a lot of the art of the game is to figure out which those hands are. Variance makes it so that sometimes it's a good strategy and sometimes it isn't. Um, Uh, another way variants can help as a tool is that it can mitigate bad balance. For example, in a game where going first wins 90% of the time, you may, as I mentioned, lose interest in the rest of the game, even if, if it's very interesting, that 10%. Um, but with more variants in the game, uh, and you, if you can get that down to 60% of the time or 65% of the time, if the game is relatively fast, then, uh, then, then that might be more acceptable. And you can switch off playing first uh, and, uh, and have a very reasonable game. And uh, anybody who's heard me talk before might think that I believe that uh, adding luck to a game is, uh, is a panacea for game design. And uh, I, I, I don't think that's true, though. Uh, but I do think it is like ibuprofen. It can uh, reduce swelling and pain in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in, in your game uh, that is too strategic. And uh, that's all. <laughs>